if anyone wants any. <laughs> Today's topic then is Mormonism. I thought Mormonism was a good follow-on to Freemasonry because Mormonism was influenced by Freemasonry heavily. Um, but mostly, there, there, there's a lot of influences on Mormonism from Freemasonry, but one of the strongest is on the temple rituals. Um, as I started compiling this information, there's no way we're going to finish it in one week. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. Um, but I, even so, I, I couldn't figure out how to pare it down. My biggest problem in, in figuring out this material isn't that there isn't material or isn't that I don't know what to teach. This is the one subject I know really, really well, <laughs> which I guess probably doesn't surprise you. And I don't know where to begin. Um, how do I teach Mormonism to a group of non-Mormons? I've already done a couple lectures. So how many, how many of you have, have been to one of my other Mormon lectures at the church? I think I gave like three or something. Okay, so I, I gave one on the Book of Mormon and the influences and where it came from. I gave another on um, kind of Mormon beliefs, an overview of Mormon beliefs, and I gave a, a third on Mormon temple rituals. Um, those were all short 45-minute forums, though, so I think my goal this time is I'm going to expand the, let's see, I want to talk about background and influences. So I want to set the stage for Joseph's life and for what happened, and then talk about kind of the history of Joseph Smith including the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, what he, where he said it came from, um, what's in it. We'll talk about what's in it. And so that's kind of that lecture I already gave on, on the Book of Mormon, but with some extra history about Joseph's life, his death, and stuff added. Um, that's probably as far as we'll, we might get to beliefs today as well. I'm not sure. Um, and then the next lecture would be the rest of beliefs, if you don't finish, and then rituals. We'll talk about temple rituals. So the temple rituals is the one that really kind of is a continuation of the Freemasonry lecture. But um, I felt like we ought to do Mormonism right after Freemasonry, but there's going to be this gap before the Freemasonry stuff becomes terribly relevant again. But um, this is what I'd like to cover. And when I started going through that, you know, you could teach, I have, I have taught a semester-long course on Joseph's life. And so now I get to do, you know, 45 minutes, and how do I do that, and what do I put in, and what do I put out? Um, so feel free to, to ask questions. <clears throat> Because there are places I could go and places I could not go, and it ought to kind of depend on how much detail you want. If you want more detail, we'll go slow. If you want to just get a quick overview, we'll go fast. Um, but I want to do what you want from me. Um, and I did this this last time. I think this one is important because in all the other things we've done, except you know maybe Freemasonry, it's not something you're going to go out tomorrow and shake hands with somebody at the grocery store and find out they're Mormon. Um, so if we're going to talk about, and this, this was supposed to be comparative history class of religion, right? So we started with dead religions, Egyptian. It's not like when I taught a lesson on Egyptian ritual, you're going to go meet somebody who worships ISIS tomorrow and then have to decide how to interact with them. That's not true when it comes to Mormonism, right? So Mormonism, there's a good couple percent of the U.S. population is Mormon. There's a lot of them in Los Alamos. For whatever reason, a lot of them work here at the lab, um, and you're going to meet a lot of Mormons. And so this is a slightly different topic and probably possibly a slightly more sensitive subject. Um, my in-laws are Mormon. And they live across the street from me, and they know I teach this class, right? So they're, they're, they're wondering what I'm going to teach. Um, there are evangelical churches who spend semester-long classes teaching about Mormonism, trying to convince people why they shouldn't, you know, listen to the Mormon missionaries or become Mormon. And that's their goal, right? To convince you not to be a Mormon, not to listen to these crazy people. Um, that's not my goal. Um, there's a joke, what do you get when you mix a Mormon and a, Uni and a Unitarian? That's someone who knocks on your door to ask you what you believe. <laughs> um, so my goal isn't to convince you that Mormons are bad, or that Mormonism isn't true, or that it's unbiblical, or that you're going to hell if you listen to the Mormon missionaries, right? I mean, I'm a universalist, I don't believe that anyway. Uh, so I have to have a slightly different goal. I'm not here to convince you, teach you all the dirty laundry in Mormons past. But when my in-laws heard I was teaching this class, we said, well, why don't you let you know us come teach it? If your church wants to know about Mormons, you wouldn't ask an ex-Mormon to learn about Mormons. You'd ask a believing Mormon, right? To know what Mormons believe, you ask a Mormon. And so that raises the next question. Am I going to teach what the Mormons would teach you if they're here? And the answer is no. 
My goal isn't to teach you that you shouldn't be a Mormon, but my goal is also to try to help you understand where Mormonism came from historically, right? And if I do that, I start showing you the influences, the historical influences in something that Mormons think was a direct revelation from God, and that's going to contradict. So you're not going to hear what a Mormon would tell you if they were here. When, but, but I'm also not here to trash Mormonism, and I'm not here to, to, to give you a bad impression of it. I'm here to try to give you my view of where it came from, what the influences were, why the things happened, happened that ha as they happened, etc. So, so, you know, you're not going to get a believing Mormon view, but you're also not going to get the sort of thing the evangelicals are going to show you to try to talk you out of being Mormon. And so this is, this is what um, the Dalai Lama said, and I think this, is, this illustrates why I do this whole class, right? why we spend all this time talking about what other people believed or didn't believe or worshipped and how they worshipped. He said, in my long years as a refugee, I've been fortunate to meet many other Buddhists. This has helped me greatly improve my understanding of their traditions while deepening my appreciation for, my, for other religious faiths too. I found that extending my, our understanding of each other's spiritual practices and traditions can be an enriching experience because to do so increases our opportunity for mutual respect. Often we encounter things in another tradition that helps us better appreciate something in our own. So it's kind of strange to start a discussion of Mormonism with uh, the Dalai Lama, but I think this illustrates why I'm doing this class. I want to you know, from, a, from the very beginning, and I, and I sent this to my in-laws, right? This, this is why I'm teaching a class on Mormonism, not, not, not to share my dis, dissatisfaction. And I am dissatisfied. I mean, I left Mormonism to come here because I was annoyed at, at, at my religious tradition. I didn't like it, and I was frustrated with it. Um, but again, that's my personal feeling, and, and I'm not here to share my frustrations either, um, even though I have some, right? So, that having been said, why in the world would... Well, so, that's why I would study another religion, but why an emphasis on Mormonism? I think Mormonism is the most interesting of the subjects I, I could teach here. I mean, ancient Egyptian is fascinating because it influenced Greek religion, which influenced Christian religion. It's kind of the oldest religious tradition we have written records of. It influenced the biblical tradition, the Old Testament biblical tradition. And so that's wow. fascinating, right? It's, it's the very heart and origin of, of religious thought. The oldest written corpus of religious texts is from ancient Egypt, the pyramid texts. You can actually read, you know, kind of someone else's Bible from 3000 BC, and that's really impressive. But Mormonism is, is more interesting in its own way. And here's why I think it's interesting. Um, imagine if you could go back in time to 200 AD and study Christianity. Right? Not study Christianity now, 2,000 years ago, from after that, but 200 years after Jesus lived, when there were still people saying, I remember my grandmother telling me about meeting Jesus. And we can do that. Like, I can talk to my grandmother, and my grandmother told stories about her grandmother, her grandfather, who was in Carthage jail the night Joseph Smith was shot and left just before the, martyr, the, the people came to attack the jail and almost died himself if he had still been there, right? And that was her grandfather's, right? And so we also, also imagine that Jesus had created Christianity in an age when there were newspapers, journals, and affidavits, right? And, and court transcripts. Because Joseph was taken to court several times, and we can read the transcripts of his trials, right? So, and, and they're fascinating, by the way. Uh, that is something you just can't do with Christianity, and, and most religious scholars would give their life to be able to. And if they just turn to Mormonism, they can. Because in Mormonism, we have a, a, a religious leader who did the sort of things Jesus did. He healed people. We have accounts where he walked into a meeting, and there was a preacher at the front who was saying things like, who could, who could ever, you know, is the power of God on the earth today? Here's a woman with a withered arm. Could anyone possibly, you know, heal her like they did in the days of Jesus? Well, no, those things are long past. It'll never happen again. And Joseph Smith was sitting in the back of the congregation, got up, walked to the front, and laid his hands on the woman's head, and he commanded her to be whole and walked away. And she got up, and her hand was, according to the story, better. Right? This is the sort of thing Jesus claimed to do. 
And here's somebody who's doing it in a day when people went home and wrote about it in their journals and then it showed up in the newspaper the next day. Right? Um, he also produced scripture. Right? So here's somebody who comes along like Moses or, or like Isaiah. Isaiah is probably a better example. <clears throat> and writes something and people figure it's, it's scripture. Now, some, that hasn't happened quite this way since Muhammad wrote the Quran or, or dictated the Quran or whatever the heck he did. And so imagine if you could go to 200 you know, years after the, the founding of Islam and look at the original manuscripts of the Quran. Well, we have the original manuscripts of the Book of Mormon. You can look at them as the scribes wrote them down, as Joseph dictated them. And you can look at the changes as he went back and fixed grammar and punctuation. And, and we've got the, the original edition. I've got a copy here. Uh, this is a, just a facsimile copy. So somebody's reprinted it, put the same old binding on it that they had, and inside is just a photocopy, is essentially, of the first edition of the Book of Mormon, published in 1830 by E.B. Grandin. And it's different than this edition that the Mormon missionaries will pass out. This one has no verses. This is divided into verses and chapters. Um, there are errors in this one that have been corrected. Some of the corrections go back to the original manuscript, right? There was an error in the printing, and they go back to the right thing. A few of them, though, don't. They deviate from the original manuscript. Some of them under Joseph's direction, as he kind of corrected his own mistakes. But, of course, he was dictating. So, is it, you know, again, this is the sort of thing that, that argue, gets argued about. Does that mean he wasn't a prophet because he changed it? Or was he dictating and his scribes got it wrong and he's fixing it? Or, or you know, how does inspiration work? If you want to understand how inspiration worked for Muhammad, it would be nice to know, did Muhammad think that he could improve upon his wording. Joseph did. And he changed his wording as he, as he thought his way through. You know, he had an idea and he wanted to express it better. So he changed it. So that's the sort of thing you can do in Mormonism. You just can't do it in these other religious traditions. And scholars would give their life to be able to, and we can. And so I think this is the mo one of the most interesting topics you will ever, ever study. If you want to go into religious, religious scholarship, Mormonism is the place to be. This is what to study, right? So that, that's the, at least in my opinion. Okay. So that's that's why this is interesting. So so how I'm going to do it, and now why it's interesting, and now let's let's do it. So, what was the environment in which Joseph grew? So obviously, as as someone who doesn't believe Joseph was really a prophet of God, um, I think he was inspired by his environment. So that's going to be my approach because that's 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 what I think. Um, but, but to see the sources is different than to see the whole. Joseph borrows from things, and I think he is the world's best borrower. He borrows from universalism. He borrows from Presbyterianism. He borrows from Methodism, and he synthesizes it all into something, and then he borrows from Freemasonry, and he attaches that, and then he grabs you know, all the stuff in the Old Testament with temples and stuff and sticks that in there, and he mixes it all together and stirs it all into a big pot, and then he takes all this folk magic stuff around him and he mixes that into a big pot and poof, out comes this, this thing that has a coherent whole to it in a way that no one would have expected. He's really good at that. And so, and, and in some senses, Joseph said that's what he was doing, right? He said that the truth had been lost, that pieces of it had been scattered throughout the earth and his job was to gather the pieces back together and put it all back into what it had originally been. So... It, he's explicitly saying I, that there is he is in my tradition because that was a fragment of the truth that was lost. And so, so either he's restoring all these fragments or he's borrowing all these pieces and putting them together into something new, right? But either way, this kind of background is, is relevant. So um, I want to first do the traditional religious influences, and then I want to do some of the untraditional religious influences because the folk magic stuff. So, who, this, does anyone know who this is? This is Edwards. He wrote the, he wrote the famous sermon, uh, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, which I think is relevant for us here as universalists because to some extent it's the origin of universalism. Uh, Christian universalism comes because Edwards wrote this sermon uh, in many ways because Edwards' sermon is the most disgusting thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Right? I mean, if you believe God is like that, I feel really bad for you. Right? This is a God who, this is the Presbyterian view, right? This is the predestination view. This is the God who creates, you know, 99% of the world so they can roast in hell 
and the angels see them all roasting as their flesh is flayed from the bones and, and the angels see it and they think how and they, they fall down at their feet and worship God because this is the most amazing, beautiful thing they've ever seen. Look at the glory of the justice of God as he punishes these evil sinners. Right? But then there's a few people saved because they listen to the to 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 God and they come to God and and they were predestined to do so, and he saves them and exalts them as glorious angels because he forgives them of his sin because Jesus died for us. This is, the, this is the heart of the sermon, right? And it makes no sense, right? Especially, you know, the, the detail. He spends all this time talking about all these children who died before they were baptized, who, you know, and he spends all this time talking about how unless they repent and come to God, they'll, they'll, they'll you know, suffer for eternity. And then he tries really hard to convince you what eternity is, right? It lasts forever and ever and ever, and it just keeps going and going and going. Well, um, Edward's sermon sparked what's called the Great Awakening in American history. Um, because people became concerned about the welfare of their eternal souls. Understandably, if this is the result of getting it wrong, you've got to get it right. And so a bunch of people started arguing about what it means to get it right. And this created these camp um, meeting fervor uh, that was sweeping through the area. And there is no doubt that this sort of thing came through Joseph's place many times. There's some argument about, in Joseph's history, he talks about uh, camp meetings just before his, his first vision experience. And there's some debate about whether there actually were camp meetings in that area. Because you can now go back and look at the newspapers and see if Joseph was telling the truth, right? And there's some debate about whether there were actual camp meetings in the area before Joseph's first vision or not. What we know is that there were some there that influenced him and his family. So at least that much we know. And these are very influential on the whole religious thinking. Yeah. What year is it? Um, right now we're about 18. Well, I don't remember when Edward's sermon happened. 17-something. The late 1700s, I think, is Edward's. And I, like I, said, I, told, I told you I printed out some notes for me and left them on my printer. I had the date on the notes. But Edward's sermon was 17-something. Um, that sparks the awakenings, and then the camp meetings. We have the first great awakening, the second great awakening, and uh, Joseph starts the church and does his thing in 1830, but he has kind of his first vision experiences back in the, 18, in the early 1820s. Um, so we'll, we'll, we're going to be back in 1820 when we start this story. Yeah. When was Joseph born? Shoot. Yeah, somebody get Wikipedia and tell me when Joseph was born. But I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say Joseph was um, it was about 30 when the church was founded in 1830. So he's probably born in 1800, give or take a couple of years. Somebody's gonna tell me how many years off I am. Um, so yeah, I think he was around 30 when he, no no he's younger than that when he founds the church. So 18. Maybe he was 20. So 1810 is now my best guess. Let's see how many years off I am. Sweet. It was right between my two guesses. Okay. So these camp meetings had some debates, and, and the principal arguments are, there's a lot of arguments. There's debates about whether you need to rebaptize children, whether you can baptize children. There's debates about, but one of the core debates is about how you're saved. And that, there's three main contending camps, and Joseph is sitting right in the middle of them watching them, right? There's the Universalists who say, there's a couple camps of Universalists. One of them might say, everybody's saved. One of them, but, but, but God will send you to hell if you've done wrong, but then he'll, it won't be forever. And after you've paid the price for your sins, everyone will eventually be saved. Um, there's other Universalists who say, well, God might separate some people, but no flaying, right? We'll leave the flaying out of it. Um, but God's eventually going to just separate some people until they, until they are ready to come in. And as soon as they're ready to come in, he'll take them back. And then there's some that just say, God just saves everybody, and there's no such thing as punishment, no such thing as, right? So there's lots of variations of universalists. Um, but then we have the Methodists. And there's a specific brand of Methodists who are active in Joseph's area, the free will Methodists. And they say, God sends some people to hell, he sends some people to heaven, and the difference is about your choice. We are all free, and if we choose God somehow, somehow we choose, somehow we don't. If we choose God, we're saved. If we don't choose God, we're damned. On the other hand is, is the Calvinists, the Presbyterians being the example. And by the way, if you go to these churches today, they don't debate these subjects. For some reason, they all just get along. But back then, they were really at each other's throat because they thought if you got this wrong, you burned. Not only did you have to accept Jesus, you had to get your salvation theory right. So this mattered 
to these people, these questions, back then, and for some reason they don't today, but the Presbyterians were the Calvinists. They're kind of the evangelicals of the modern world, but from their view, God is so, so sovereign that he chooses everything, including, and, and, and by the way, you're so lowly and, and lost that you can't choose to follow God. No one could choose to follow God without God's grace acting on it. So God's grace comes down and, and, and acts on a few people, so they choose God. Without God, they would, they would be forever lost. But God touches a few people, and those people choose God. But they didn't choose God because they, were, they chose it. They chose God because God chose them. Right. And then, then their good works are, are just a sign of their chosen status. And those people are saved, and everyone else burns. You know, the, the problem with this is, and this is Edward's view, the problem with it, of course, is that it, it makes God this person who, who enjoys re- creating people, creating them bad, letting them be bad because he created them bad and because he didn't choose to save them, and then roasting them forever. Right? This, is, this is what we what the universalist, the early universalist called a slander against the good name of God. Right? And Joseph is watching this stuff. And this is uh, Hosea Ballou. He's... Uh, a Vermont Universalist preacher who, who really kind of starts universalism in Vermont. No, it doesn't start it, but he, he's, he's kind of the leader of the universalist movement in Vermont. And I had a whole bunch of quotes from him in my notes that I was going to read that I've left home. Um, I mean, think of what the most important thing to say. He's one of the first Unitarian Universalists as well. He's not just a Universalist. He's kind of a Unitarian Universalist. And, and I guess the reason he's interesting for our story is he's the leader of universalism in Vermont, and Joseph Smith Sr. and his father are from Vermont. And so the, the Smiths are universalists. Um, this, this is Asel Smith. This is Joseph Smith Sen- Jr.'s grandfather. So, so we got too many people here. I guess I need to tell you who they are. Now, Asel Smith is the grandfather. Joseph Smith Sr. is his father, and Joseph Smith Jr. is the prophet dude that the Mormons talk about. So this is his grandfather. Although Asa believed in a personal God and Savior, he came to oppose the established churches. So he's a dis, kind of a disestablishmentarianism dude, right? Uh, he served as a moderator of a meeting that established one of the early universalist societies in Vermont, 1797. So this puts him there about what Hosea Ballou is going to be wandering through. Um, He also subscribed to the universalist doctrine that the atonement of Christ was sufficient to redeem all men. Despite this departure from traditional New England orthodoxy, his writings showed him to be a man of warm Christian faith. So this is uh, Asel Smith. Joseph Smith Sr. is also uh, one of those guys who doesn't go to church. He just doesn't go to church because he doesn't like churches and he thinks they're all messed up. But the reason he doesn't go, and he borrows this from Asel, is both of them believe that the true teachings of Christ have been lost. And so why go to a church that doesn't have the true teachings of Christ? So when these preachers were coming around trying to convince you, you have to believe this to be saved, you have to believe this to be saved, Joseph Smith, Asel, and Joseph would say, no, you don't. God can save everybody. He's a universalist. And the true teachings of Christ are lost, but that's okay. God is going to forgive us for not having the true teachings, but we should be out looking for them. So both Joseph Sr. and Asel were out looking for this kind of restoration of the truth. Now this comes back to the Freemasonry discussion, right? Do you remember the lost word of Masonry? So when I taught my le- the class on Masonry last month, there was this whole story of the lost word, that a substitute was put in its place. So for these people, the current Christianity, that was a metaphor. And the current version of Christianity was the substitute. But the truth was lost and we were waiting for it to be refound or restored. And so that was both the belief of Asel and Joseph Smith, and by the way of, um, oh heck, President of the United States. George Washington. No, <laughs> Thomas Jefferson. Thomas. Thomas Jefferson, right? And so it was a popular kind of belief in the day. Asel fought in the Revolutionary War, by the way. Okay. Um, he prophesied. This is one of those interesting moments because I think to understand Joseph, you need to understand the family pressure put on him. Asel prophesied that God was going to raise up a branch of his family that would be a great benefit to mankind religiously. Before he died, he read the Book of Mormon. I don't think, my understanding is he never joined the LDS church because he died first. But before he died, he said he believed that Joseph Smith was the person that was going to fulfill his prophecy after seeing the Book of Mormon, and then he died right after, before ever getting to join the church. On that side of his family, we have the Universalist. On this side, we have Lucy Mack Smith. She's a Presbyterian. 
And Lucy Mack Smith marries Joseph Smith Sr. So this is Joseph's mother. So Joseph's mother is a Presbyterian. And I don't know if she was born Presbyterian or if she just joined the Presbyterian faith during the, during the revivals. But she joined, she was certainly Presbyterian during the revivals, and she bullied Joseph Smith Sr. into going to church with her. Uh, Joseph Smith Sr., there's actually some evidence that he was kind of a drunk, and, and he, he did a little things, he did some things that, you know, they kind of thought weren't quite the right thing to do, and she wanted to get him churched, you know. And he didn't go to church because he thought the truth was lost. He was a religious person, but he didn't go to church. And his, his, Lucy thought that was the failing. She needed to get him to church. So she dragged Joseph Smith Sr. to church. And according to family rumor, this is one of my favorite Mormon stories, Asel Smith blew a gasket. He stormed over to the house, shouted a lot, threw a copy of Thomas Paine, the, the, the what is it called, the what of reason, the something of reason? Common sense. Common sense, or, sense. Or, or the something of reason. Um, he threw a copy of Thomas Paine to Joseph Smith uh, Sr. Uh, and then um, bade him read it until he came to his senses. <laughs> so that is one of my favorite stories of the Universalist. Uh, the Universalist kind of intellectual um, getting frustrated with the Presbyterian. Um, and so, so what that means is that in Joseph Smith's own family, there's a debate between the Universalists and the Presbyterians. And one of the problems with this debate is that the person who represents the universalist maybe isn't the most devout in their behavior, and that's his father. So Joseph comes to the conclusion that the belief in universal salvation and the lack of fear of hell and punishment leads people to improper behavior. So Joseph kind of has this feeling, I believe, that, and it comes out in the Book of Mormon. There's, a there's at least several characters in the Book of Mormon who are universalists. Um, in fact, they have a church called the Nehors because they're started by a guy named Nehor, and he's a universalist. And Nehor murders a dude who is actually one of their war heroes in the Book of Mormon after arguing about religion. He got so frustrated with him, he took out a sword and killed him. Then they took him to trial, and he gave this long-winded, flooring defense of his, of his teachings, right, in the trial. And that's in the Book of Mormon story. We have another, uh, you know, uh, another universalist named um, Corianton. Is Alma, there's a character in the Book of Mormon called Alma. Alma's a prophet. This is his son. So this is the prophet's son who becomes a universalist. And he goes off and has sex with a, with a prostitute. Named Isabel, no less. I mean, this is perfect, right? So he has, he sleeps with the with the with the with the the prostitute Isabel. Uh, I think that's her name. I have to go back and look at the story. I may be messing this up. It's been a while. And uh, and then his father gives him four chapters worth of lecture on why universalism is wrong in the Book of Mormon. So so think about that. You have a father teaching his son why universalism is wrong because it led him to sleep with a prostitute that stands in as the proxy of Joseph Smith Jr. telling his dad why universalism is wrong because it led to improper behavior. So, so you see why I think the Book of Mormon is inspired by Joseph's life from this, this sort, of, sort of thing. But imagine Joseph caught between these warring camps of the Presbyterians and the Universalists in his own home. And while he's doing this, he's going to camp meetings, according to his own story. He's going to camp meetings where they're having revivals. And he... he kind of digs the Methodists, right? Because the Methodists have this whole idea of free will, right? You, 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 you choose. God's out there wanting to save you all, but some of us choose to go the other way, and he has to let us. And Joseph, Joseph loves the doctrine of free agency. In fact, Joseph's, according to Joseph's telling of theology, Satan and God had a fight in heaven over free agency because Satan was a universalist and wanted to save everybody. <laughs> no joke. Satan is the universalist, right, in the story. But, but God says in order to save everybody, you'd have to take away their free will because you wouldn't, you'd have to prevent them from sinning because that's the only way to save them all because they can't come back and be like me if they're sinners. So you'd have to send them to earth and keep them from sinning, and that would destroy their free will. So there was a war in heaven fought over agency, not universalism. In Mormon speak, we usually say the war in heaven was fought over agency, whether man would have agency. But it's, a, it's, again, a debate about universalism versus Methodism. And it's Joseph preferring his Methodist belief over his father's universalism. And he's put it into his theology as a description of the very purpose of life and why Satan and his angels fell from heaven in this argument. 
And, and he also adds this point of pride, right? Satan was going to save everybody, and he would have the glory, and he would be the sa- and, and Jesus said, I'll save those who want to be saved, and I'll suffer to do it. And Satan said, no, just let me be in charge, and I'll make sure everyone's good. And, and, and I'll, be, I'll have the glory, and, right? So, so this, is, this is that idea of the pride of Satan caused him to fall. When God chose, listened to the two proposals, chose Jesus' over Satan's, Satan was angry. So again, the pro- part, of the, part of the problem in Satan's fall is not just his universalism, not just that he proposed his own plan, but that he got angry when he wasn't chosen and stormed off in a huff. And then Joseph, of course, makes this point. It's a good point, by the way that we sometimes get angry and ruin our own, you know, we end up messing ourselves up by our own anger and frustration over what's happening instead of just humbly saying, okay. How many people, by the way, in the universal, you all know somebody like this. They got angry at the pastor and they quit coming, right? <laughs> this, this is Satan, right? He gets angry at the pastor and quits coming. Um, and, 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 you know, to his own, in Satan's case, to his own detriment. In someone else's case, maybe they find a better pastor, you know. But, but again, this, this creates the fodder for all sorts of wonderful sermons in Mormonism, you can imagine, right? Okay, so Joseph goes to the camp meetings and he prefers Methodism. Um, now let's talk, though, about the folk traditions. I mean, those are the traditional religious influences on Joseph, and even in a Mormon kind of congregation, they'll tell you about those. These are the ones they don't like to talk about so much because they're not quite as faith-promoting, you know, from, from the Mormon perspective. So, you know, the Mormon story is Joseph was faced with these influences. He goes to God and finds out which one is right. And, 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 and it's none of them, by the way. It's not quite Methodism. Joseph, when I'll get to his theology, he, he mixes Methodism with universalism. Right? So you've got free will deciding whether you're saved now, you know, but everyone's sort of saved and just about where you, where you, which kingdom of glory you go to. And God does punish people because he has to, justice and mercy, but, but the punishment isn't forever. Right, so, so Joseph mixes Methodism and, and Universalism together into his own kind of brand of, of Mormonism. And it evolves, by the way. The, the, the Book of Mormon is very free will Methodist, and Joseph's revelations later are very Universalist, and so his thinking kind of evolves. But he mixes the two together. You'll hear that story, but they'll, it'll be told as revelation where God, Joseph, God helps Joseph answer the questions of his day. These influences they leave out, usually, um, because they're not quite as inspiring, I guess. Um, and, and again, this, these, when, I, when I share these, these are when the Mormons start saying, well, you know, you're, you're, you're an anti-Mormon. Um, they will often accuse um, people who spread these sorts of stories about Joseph as liars. Um, for years, they would act, people got excommunicated from the church for trying to tell this story of Joseph Smith that I'm about to do next. Um, the, the problem with that is the internet um, and, and the, the first-hand sources. We have journal entries, not from enemies of Joseph, because that's the story that's spent, is the enemies of Joseph spread these rumors about him, but they're not true. That was Satan trying to destroy the work, right? The problem is we have journal entries from Joseph's family, friends, and people who were on Joseph's side who tell this version of the story. So at some point, you just have to sit down and say, okay, this is the reality. And um, this is an interesting time to be alive and looking at Mormonism, at, at modern Mormonism, because um, Mormonism split into two groups. One group admitted this stuff right away. The other group denied it for years and has just recently published a bunch of essays on their webpage over the last three or four years admitting all this stuff and then putting a spin on it. Right? But they're finally buckled down. They, and, and most of us think it's not because they're transparent from the beginning, but because they had to. People would read the correlated story, and then they go off on the internet and find this story, and then they'd say, oh, I've been lied to. And then one or two of them would say, well, let's look at the sources. And then they go, holy cow, this has got to be right. And then they feel like the church lied to them, and the church was lo- losing a lot of members who felt lied to. And so just in the last maybe 10, 15 years, they've started changing and admitting some of this stuff. And, and, you know, we have these historian scholars who've been excommunicated over this who are now like, well, you're using my published research in footnotes in your webpage document, and you excommunicated me over publishing this thing, and you're telling me I'm right? You know. <laughs> so, okay, folk religious influence. I, 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 first is Freemasonry, right? Freemasonry has all sorts of folk religious tradition, and the big one is the loss of the 
keyword, right? The loss, that something's lost and it needs to be restored. But there's a lot more than that. There's also this view about how it would be restored. And these myths and legends were spread. We've got newspapers and things where, where these stories are, we can read them, that even in the non-Masonry, the people who weren't Masons knew these stories because they were part of the tradition that surrounded Joseph. And one of the stories is from the seventh degree of Masonry, um, the ritual of the seventh degree, and it's that when when the word was, does anyone, does it, do you guys remember how the word was lost? I, some of you weren't even there. Maybe I should redo this whole story. Um, <laughs> Three people got together to build the Temple of Solomon. Hiram Abiff, Hiram, King of Tyre, and, and King Solomon. They made it, they, there was a sacred word that was going to be the key word that you would use to prove that you were a master mason, but it was also related to the name of God, and it was supposed to have mystical powers because it, if you have the name of God, that's the definition of God itself, and to know God is to have eternal life. So there's all these connections between knowing that word and knowing God and having eternal life. And what happened was um, they had made a covenant that when the temple was finished, they would reveal this word that the three of them knew to everyone, to all the workers, in, in, as a reward for their building of the temple. And then it would go out into the world and, and fill the world. Um, one of them was assaulted by the other workers in the temple who, who uh, attacked him and said, give us the word now. And he says, finish the temple and then I'll give it to you. No, give it to us now. And he said, I've made a covenant not to. And they said, give it to us now. Break your And he said, I would rather die than break my covenant. And they killed him. This is Hiram, Abiff. So Hiram Abiff dies because he wouldn't reveal the key word. The problem is now Hiram, king of Tyre, and Solomon had made a covenant not to disclose the key word without all three of them present at the building of the temple, so they took the key word to their death. But before they did, they created a substitute that would stand in its place, and they gave the substitute to all the workers, but they took the, the real word to their death. However, um, just before the flood, luckily enough, a guy... Um, um, oh, heck. Um, why, why is this so hard? Enoch. Enoch, uh, before the flood, dug a cave. And in the bottom of that cave, he had a golden triangular plate. So you'll see the gold plates of Mormonism coming up here in just a minute. But he built on a golden plate. And on that golden plate, he inscribed in, in mystical characters that no one else could read the name. And later, when they were building the temple, some people descended down into this cave because they found the cave, luckily enough, under the Temple of Solomon. And as they went down under exploring this cave, they found the golden plate. And then they found the ineffable writing. And then there was a key that would decode the ineffable writing. And they, they, were, they found out what the name was that had been lost. And they restored that which was lost by finding it written on a golden plate. Most Masons find that, uh, believe that the, the name given in the ritual there is also still just a substitute, that it's just, they're telling the story of how the name was restored, but we still don't have the name. These, I, I don't know exactly how this works. Um, so there's our ineffable characters. That's the key. The key is, is here to, to decode them. And the name is written on this golden plate, a triangular golden plate, which you'll, show, you'll see show up in all sorts of little badges and things from, from masonry. Uh, but it also shows up in really fun places like the Dartmouth seal. There's our golden plate with uh, El Shaddai, the name of God written in Hebrew, which isn't the name, right? It's the, it's the, it stands for the name. So there's El Shaddai written on the golden plate with the light shining down and the college. And over here is really fun. This is where it gets really interesting. These are American Indians carrying a book. So these American Indians have this book that is going to restore that which was lost because the American Indians had these traditions, you see. Because you'll notice that when, when the Spaniards come and find the American Indians, they start listening to the American Indians, or the, they're not, you know, the South American Indians, stories about white gods, Quetzalcoatl, right? And all sorts of Mormons love to talk about Quetzalcoatl because they think it's Christ. And they think that's evidence for the Book of Mormon, but, but it's evidence for the origin of the myths that Christ had visited the Americas and that there was some lost pieces of the teachings of Christ maybe buried in, in these teachings of these Indians. Maybe the Indians once knew, right? Maybe they had a piece that, that we can put their piece together with our piece, we can find that which was lost. And there it is in, in the Dartmouth Seal, right? With this influence. And this is a cultural influence in which Joseph grows up. There's another guy who writes a book, um, Ethan Smith, Origin of the Hebrews, where he posits that maybe the, 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 
maybe the Indians were actually Jewish settlers, one of the lost 10 tribes of Israel who had migrated to America. And he makes that suggestion. And we have a couple other um, fictional books. Solomon Spalding wrote a manuscript about the American Indians being lost tribes of Israel, et cetera. Um, and there's been all sorts of great conspiracy theories that Joseph just stole Spalding's book and changed it a little, which is dumb because we found Spalding's manuscript and it doesn't look anything like the Book of Mormon. Um, then the conspiracy theorist, to never let a good conspiracy die, said, well, yeah, but he wrote two manuscripts, and it's, it's the other manuscript that was lost that it's entirely possible. I don't know, but, but what I think we ought to admit is that whether Joseph stole Spalding's manuscript, the concept of this lost tribe stuff is in Joseph's culture, and he's borrowing from it. Um, the other thing that happens in Joseph's day is the death of Captain William Morgan. Um, William Morgan was a Freemason, and he wrote a, a book that I passed around his book, actually, last class, um, exposing the rituals of Freemasonry. And a few, mm, I don't know how long after that, he vanished mysteriously from sight, and the tradition is the bunch of Masons murdered him to keep his secret. And at that point, the, this big anti-Masonry movement started in the United States. For a while, they were the biggest political party in the U.S., and they made this term secret combinations. Secret combinations are going to destroy the world. This is, this is the Illuminati um, conspiracy theorists that we see today, the people who believe in, in the, the snake men, you know, that they're really controlling the world. And, um, and so the, the, to stop the Masons who are murdering people for revealing their secrets, we need to, you know, denounce all secret combinations. So in the Book of Mormon, there's a group of people with secret handshakes who start a secret combination, and they're called the Gadiat and Robbers, and their entire purpose is to keep the secrets of others so they can rob from other people. And this stuff is straight out of the anti-Masonry movement. So he's borrowing from the Masonic traditions, which are part of his culture. His father is a Mason, but he's also clearly influenced by the anti-Masons. Joseph himself will join the Masons many years later, by the way, about the time when the anti-Masonry fervor dies down. And suddenly he's like, oh, okay, and he joins the Masons. But the Book of Mormon has this strain of anti-Masonry in it. And, again, people who use that, who say that this is evidence, that the believing Mormons will say, well, Joseph joined the Masons. Clearly he's not influenced by anti-Masonry. But, but I think you can be influenced by something and have kind of a mixed view of it, right? I think that's overly simplifying. Um, so in the time when the anti-Masonry fervor is at its peak, Joseph writes the Book of Mormon, and it's got anti-Masonry stuff in it. Then he joins the Masons later in his life. He also marries the widow of Captain Morgan as one of his plural wives, which is one of those really bizarre moments in, in history that I, I, don't, I don't even know where to begin to, to tell you how flabbergasting that particular bit of history is. Um, here he is in Nauvoo becoming a Mason, and he marries Captain Morgan's widow and then is murdered by a bunch of Masons. I, 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 okay, anyway, I don't, I don't know how to even <laughs> begin to explain how flabbergasting that is to me, but okay. So we got these American Indian traditions of, of the Lost Ten Tribes. And there's an entire book uh, on this, um, Indian Origins of the Book of Mormon, Religious Solutions from Columbus to Joseph Smith, which I recommend if you're interested in kind of, uh, I don't have a copy of this. I've got a copy of a lot of stuff, and I'll show you, we'll go through those books in a bit. But, but this one is, is interesting. Um, it's one of the ones I don't have, but, but that I would recommend if you want to know more about the, the traditions about Lost Ten Tribes among the Indians in Joseph's day. Dan Vogel collected a whole bunch of them. That's a good resource. Um, so the other, the other thing is folk magic, right? So Joseph is, Freemasonry is connected to a cult. What we, you know, there's a negative impression of the occult. But the occult is, if you look at what the occult is, the occult is a bunch of collections of religious folk magic stuff, right? And a lot of it is based in alchemy. And alchemy was this whole idea of transmuting your heart into gold, and, and, and that was a spiritual journey that would change yourself more than the gold you would find to create the Philosopher's Stone. Um, and so folk magic and the occult are, are mixed in Joseph's culture, and the difference between cult and religion is you believe it or you don't, or you think it's, or your friends believe it or you don't, right? So, so folk tradition has this negative connotation to it that I think is, is slightly um, misplaced. But a call bearer is someone who is born with the placenta still covering their face. That's called a call bearer. 
And the folk tradition is someone who is a call bearer will have the third eye or the third sight. They can see things other people can't. Well, Joseph Smith Sr. told neighbors that Joseph was Jr., the guy who becomes the prophet, was born with a veil over his face. So he wanted to in procure a stone for him that would let him see all over the world. So the, the stone thing is, is the equivalent of the crystal ball tradition that, that shows up in you know, gypsy traditions and that sort of thing. This is crystal gazing. This is stone gazing. This is seeing afar off with, with your third eye sort of uh, tradition. And the tradition was if you're born with the placenta over your face, you have this third sight. Now remember, now let's think about Joseph Sr. for just a minute. Here's a guy who's a universalist who is a practitioner of folk magic who doesn't like organized religion but will go out with his friends treasure seeking with, with his folk magic friends. And he has a son with a call born over his face and he has a, a father who had prophesied that one of his children would change the world's religious face forever. And he's like, aha, Joseph. So I think it's hard to overemphasize the pressure that was almost certainly put on Joseph Smith to be the person his father thought he was, a seer. And so to become a seer, well, so, so what did Joseph Smith Sr. do with the seers? Well, th this is part of the folk magic stuff. Um, they went money digging or treasure seeking, and there may be a distinction between the two that Joseph makes. Um, to seek treasures could be to seek spiritual treasures, meaning seeking that which is lost, trying to restore everything that was missing. Um, but you could also seek money that had been buried in the ground, right? And, and the two were sometimes connected, and the traditions for how you do this are the same. So. Again, part of this Indian tradition, there's all these treasures buried all over, and there's Spanish gold mines, and there's Indians who buried treasures, and there's El Dorado and the City of Gold, right? And you want to find all these lost treasures. In fact, the Book of Mormon will describe the Indians burying their treasures in the ground and then not being able to find them again because of their wickedness, because they're cursed. And part of that, being able to find them again, is they're guarded by guardian spirits according to this folk tradition. So they're guarded by guardian spirits. And what you do is you, you take your crystal ball, your seer stone, and you gaze into it, and you see a vision of where the treasure is. Now Joseph's descriptions of this are fascinating. He talks about, he has all sorts of excuses for why he can't find the treasures he sees. The first is, it's like looking into a glass, right? You know how glass ref refracts the angle? So he can't tell quite where it is. But the other is, these treasures are guarded by these it's a spiritual quest, not, a, not necessarily a monetary quest. It's a spiritual quest, and these treasures are guarded by spirits, guardian angels. And if you don't appease the spirit, when you dig the hole, the treasure will actually slip through the earth and disappear. And one of his friends, Oren Porter Rockwell, mm -hmm. describes going on a treasure-seeking expedition with Joseph. Now, Porter Rockwell is not an anti-Mormon trying to lie to, to defame Joseph. Porter Rockwell is Joseph's bodyguard. He's the guy that almost certainly shot... Wilburn W. Boggs, governor of Missouri, after Missouri governor chased the Mormons out of Missouri, he went back and tried to assassinate him, almost certainly. And he was the guy that Joseph prophesied that as long as he never cut his hair, he would never die by an assassin's bullet. So he had this long hair, and he was a gunslinger in the, in the Old West. Once he goes to Utah, he's one of these fun gunslingers who, who killed maybe 20, 30 people at some point. And there were other people who would try to kill him just to prove Joseph a liar, and they would always lose. Whenever they, he had a gunfight, he would win because that was the prophecy of Joseph and he never cut his hair. <laughs> and then apparently he cut his hair once to make a wig for, for Joseph's, was it Joseph's mother or someone of Joseph's family? And he made the comment at the time, I would rather die in fulfillment of Joseph's prophe prophecy than, than, than see one of Joseph's, this is how much I love Joseph's family. So he cut his hair and he never did die by an assassin, but even when he cut his hair once, he didn't. Anyway. Orrin Porter Rockwell, colorful, colorful Mormon character, gunslinger, Wild West dude, um, you know, guard, guarded, guarded money treasures as the you know, co stage coaches went back and forth and shot bandits and really fun stuff. When he, he grew up with Joseph, and he went treasure seeking with Joseph. And he tells the story about seeing the chest there as one minute and then slipped through the earth the next, and he tried to catch it with his pitch and and broke off a little sliver, and he kept it as a memento for the rest of his life. 
So the, 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 my point is these stories aren't coming from anti-Mormons. They're coming from people who believe Joseph. And they said this is what Joseph grew up doing. And the reason Joseph grew up doing it was because his dad did it. And the reason his dad did it was because he was part of this folk magic tradition. And so the most recent biography of Joseph Smith, probably the best, um, is by this guy, Richard Bushman. So if you're looking for a good biography of Joseph Smith, this is by far the best that's ever been written. It's by Richard Bushman, and he is an Oxford-trained historian. I mean, Oxford or Harvard? I can't remember. Um, anyway, he's got one of these Ivy League historian degrees, and he's a Mormon. He's a believing Mormon. It's still the best biography of Joseph Smith. Right? And he gets to this treasure-seeking stuff, and he says, this was Joseph's culture. Of course, he grew up doing this stuff. And he lays it all out, admits it, and then says, but it doesn't mean anything. This is, this is just Joseph's culture. <laughs> it might have been you know, a training ground for his spiritual, spiritual feelings. But, but so, so the point is, here we have a really good biography. If you want the details of, of what Joseph grew up doing and, and his life, this is where to go to get it. Even though he's a believer, he will, he will sort of leave his believing hat at the door when he writes his history. And he says, I'm just going to tell you the history. And then he, he will every once in a while spin it a little bit. But he tells you when he's doing that. And so it's, it's worth reading. If you really want to learn Joseph's, his, Joseph's life, this is the book to go pick up. If you want to really learn his life, right? If you want to learn the, the kind of church whitewashed version, this is the book to pick up, right? <laughs> right. So this is this is the, the the book that goes with the class they teach on on church history, right? Not a single mention of treasure seeking, except for one. In Joseph Smith's official history, he says that a guy named Josiah Stowall wanted to find a, span, a, a rumored buried Spanish mine, and he hired Joseph to help him find the mine. Joseph agreed. And eventually talked him out of it, said it was a bad idea, you should quit, and talked him out of it. And in the story, Joseph talks him out of it. And he says, this is why everyone says I'm a money digger, because I work for Josiah Stowell. The problem is, that's not true. Joseph did work for Josiah Stowell, but he wasn't just hired to find the mine. He was hired to be the seer to find the mine. It's true Joseph may have been the one to talk him out of it, um, but... To claim that's why he was called a money digger is really disingenuous because Joseph grew up doing this stuff a lot more than this once. So he kind of puts it off as this one-off that this guy hired him and he, and he needed money so he took the job, but, but he didn't really like it and he tried to talk him out of it. And that's the way he tells the story and that's not anywhere close to what really happened. This is like I did not inhale. Yeah, this is a, this is a, this is a this is an I did not inhale moment, right? That's a really good description of this, right? Um, <clears throat> that's a really good way to say it. I'm gonna have to use that from now on, right? But this is Joseph's I did not inhale moment, and it's in his official history, and that's the only discussion of kind of the treasure-seeking stuff that the, the the official record usually talks about. And then again, this is this is actually really fun. If you want to get it, this book, I think you can get it online. I think the church puts it on their webpage. You can probably get it called Our Heritage, A Brief History of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And it ha this is kind of the, the, if you're a beginning student and want to learn church history, this is the book they give Believing Mormons. And you'll see how they tell these stories in ways that make them in incredibly inspiring, right? And, and, and moving and, and things. They're just not quite, <laughs> most of them are true, but, but there's so much they're just leaving out, right? Um, so, so it's fun to compare this to this, mm -hmm. right, and, and see the differences. Um, they're fascinating. And again, usually this was all the church would say. This is the sort of thing they would say, and it's about all they would say. And now they've, they've kind of put stuff on their webpage that looks more like that now. Yeah. Can I ask a question of ignorance? So I know that the Mormons go around and proselytize all over the world. Sure. And this guy, who's a scholar, was a British Mormon. How large? Are congregations around the world relative to the U.S.? There are more Mormons on the books outside of the U.S. than in the U.S. Mm -hmm. A lot of them are in South America, and a lot of them are inactive, and it's really hard to kind of wrap your head around, meaning they, they got baptized, but, but they don't go anymore. But was that because um, there was a big push in, in recruitment? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, there's, the, the church is extraordinary and has from the beginning been, been ex interested in missionary work. I mean, the first thing they do when they, they um, form the church is send out a bunch of missionaries. 
and one of Sam, one of Joseph's brothers takes the first copy of the Book of Mormon as soon as it's printed and wanders off as a missionary with that purser script, just kind of wandering through. And he, he puts it, gives the Book of Mormon to somebody who gives it to somebody who gives it to Brigham Young. And so one of the, one of the, again, one of those really fun moments in church history is that the very first missionary placed a Book of Mormon that, con- that converted Brigham Young, who would be the second prophet. Of, but they've always been interested in, in, but in I conversion. Think so much of it seems to be tied to the U.S., but that doesn't matter to other people. Well, so the, the Book of Mormon is, is, is one, of the, one of the influences on the Book of Mormon is, is American superiority, right? That America is a chosen promised land. Right. And so that plays very well in South America. Maybe America. America, America, America. yeah. <laughs> the Americas are a chosen land. And that plays very well in South America. Um, it plays very well in, in the U.S. Um, and there is some concept, not just that the Americas are chosen, but, but the American Constitution, Joseph says, was inspired by God. Those men were chosen by God to create a free land where the gospel could be restored. Um, so there is almost some U.S. American superiority in there, too. Uh, but, you know, you can, you can recast Mormonism in a way that, that that's not its central point, and other people can, can accept it. it. It plays well in Africa. If you ever go see the Book of Mormon musical, I saw that. <laughs> you saw that. All right, so we got more. We got been transformed a little bit. Yeah, we, we've got <laughs> we've got missionaries in Africa, uh, India, um, but our biggest Mormon conversion rates are biggest in South America, in the U.S. But there's some big ones in Africa too. Um, they're kind of the race issue is is a big deterrent, I think. So this is this is the folk magic tradition he's 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 involved in, and and again, once you believe there's a buried treasure, it may be a spiritual treasure. And some of the very first revelations of Joseph Smith are God saying, "Quit seeking. I know you're poor, I know you're miserable because of your poverty, but seek spiritual treasures. Don't seek physical treasures." And again, those are some of the very first revelations that we get recorded from Joseph. These these admonitions to 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 quit seeking for wealth to give up this quest for wealth. So the question is, if you're seeking whether it's a physical or spiritual treasure, how do you find it? And, and you got divining rods. Oliver Cowdery, Joseph Smith's scribe, was a, was a um, diviner who would help people figure out where um, to dig for wells using, using rods. And uh, again, one of the revelations first given, this is, this is what I say about first editions of revelations right one of the first one of the first revelations joseph has is to oliver who is his scribe when he does the book of mormon <clears throat> where he says only the power of god could cause this rod of nature to work in your hand and he's talking about oliver's use of divining rods and the later editions of the same revelation call it um, you have the power of the rod of aaron with no description of what that is and so so that his 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 folk magic participation has been brushed over by changing the wording of the revelation um so again you can find it with divining rods but the most the most kind of famous way to do it is with a seer stone this was a green seer stone that belonged to joseph smith um, for a time this was one of the few we had i had pictures of so i would always show this when i gave this story i'll tell you a story about this in just a minute but joseph used about five or six seer stones during his life to get revelations to find buried treasures that he never found but also to get revelations and and, and this sort of thing um, and we have fun stories of joseph convincing people that he can do this because you know one of the times he's treasure seeking he says it's buried over there by a feather and they would find the feather but not the treasure because the treasure would slip away who knows how he put the feather there or if, he, if he did maybe it was just really there he would he, somebody else lost a pin and he used his stone to find the pin that was lost Somebody else lost their cattle, and he told them where to go find them. So, and people would swear that Joseph, they knew Joseph could do this because he had done it for them. But this is one of the stones he would use. We know, however, that there was one he liked best. And he found this stone while digging a well for Willard Chase. Now, the story, this is where fun, because Willard Chase had a daughter, Sally Chase, and Sally Chase was a seer. She used seer stones. Joseph went to Sally and said, Sally, can I borrow your seer stone? Sally let her borrow it. Joseph used her seer stone, and he saw a vision, according to his story, of a white stone buried in the ground. And he went over and he dug up this white stone and found it right where he 
he had seen it in Sally's stone. And he found this stone and he used, that was, his, that was one of the first year stones he used. I remember Joseph Smith Sr. said he was going to find a stone for his son. Well, now Joseph has a stone. He got it from Sally. But now Joseph is digging a well for Sally Chase, for, 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 sorry, Willard Chase, Sally's father. And while he's digging this well, he finds a stone that is interesting looking, and he keeps it. And he starts using it in his treasure seeking. And Willard Chase sues Joseph in court to get the stone back because it was found on his property because he wants to give it to Sally. So we have court records about the suit for the stone to get it back so Sally can have it, right? This is the description of the stone. A salacious granite dark color, almost black with light colored stripes, somewhat resembling petrified poplar or cottonwood bark. It is about the size, but not the shape, of a hen's egg. It's by Hosea Stout. He was stone, shown the stone by Brigham Young. Notice the date, 1856, Joseph is dead. So what happens is after Joseph's death, this stone gets passed down to Brigham Young through his brother Phineas. And J Brigham kept it in the church archives and put it on the altar at the dedication of one of the Mormon temples. This is the stone Joseph use when, uses when he finds the Book of Mormon and translates it. And the church has it. And it, it was on one of those really fun, you know, kind of rumors that would always float around Mormon circles. Where's the stone? Where are the, do, the, do the prophets today still use the stone? I mean, does it work? And I remember um, Joseph Fielding McConkie, who was the son of Joseph, of, of Bruce R. McConkie, who was an apostle of the Mormon church, so now you get it like fourth hand. This apostle told his son that it's in the archives. I've seen it. I've handled it. And it doesn't work for me, mm -hmm. is, is the way he said it. And then that was told to his son, who told it to me when I was chatting with him at, in my office one day when we were teaching religion at BYU. So he was a religion BYU teacher. I was there. We were chatting about the stone. And he said, well, my dad said he saw it. And it doesn't work for him, <laughs> whatever that means, right? So, so these sorts of fourth-hand rumors would kind of float around Mormon, Mormondom. And we know that Brigham Young had it, and we know that he put it on the stone, and we have a description of it from someone who saw it back when Brigham Young showed it to him. And then, in the Church Magazine for October, which is next month, but put online early, because it was about to make a stir, is an article by the current church historian with that picture in it. <laughs> and so... For the first time, Mormons saw in living color with lots of different close-up pictures, Joseph Searstone. And you would think in Mormon internet circles that the world had just ended, right? Because there were all sorts of people who literally, they would go to their parents and be like, Joseph used to use a Searstone to translate them. And they're like, no, he didn't. That's all just anti-Mormon nonsense. Have you seen the end sign? And they were like, what? And then they go read it, and they'd be like, oh, my gosh. And then a whole bunch of people. I have friends who left the church over this. <laughs> and I kind of shook my head and said, I've known about this for years. I mean, <laughs> anyway, but, but, but the fact that the church is publishing pictures of it, it just, it just floored a whole bunch of people because this is not the story of the Book of Mormon they get told growing up. It's there. It's in our history. But most people don't read that stuff, right? So anyway, it, it really messed a lot of people up okay so that's that's the origins of Joseph. so we've got the folk traditions we've got the freemasonry we've got the religious traditions we've got universalism and all those things influence joseph so now i'm going to tell you joseph's story we've already sort of hinted at it right but but those are the influences now we're going to just start at the beginning and tell you joseph's life till the moment he dies and i'm going to try to do that in the next in the next uh, 45 minutes let's take about a five minute break though and have some food, and I need a drink. And I'll come back in about five minutes, and I'll try to tell you Joseph's story.